take a hand if you make it obvious enough, okay? Uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. I'm Joe Mendelson, Curator of Herpetology here at Zoo Atlanta, and it's my extreme pleasure to introduce Harry Green for his second talk of the day. So if his voice blows out, you'll understand why. And uh, I guess one of Harry's biggest distinctions is that he's not ashamed of the fact that he calls himself a natural historian. Okay, realize in the halls of academia for many, many years, natural history was a bad word. And uh, it, almost as bad as calling yourself an ornithologist or a primatologist or a herpetologist, right? If there weren't molecules involved, and if there weren't, uh, even sometimes, if there was just observations rather than a hypothesis testing experiment, um, then you weren't doing science. And that was really the atmosphere for many, many years. And Harry had the uh, personal and professional clout to really help change that. And for people in my generation come up and say, I'm looking at you know the behavioral ecology and natural history of some of these Central American toads or something like that, it's really nice to have this 900-pound uh, gorilla that I hadn't even met behind me, you know? And, um, and what Harry has also done, again, from the halls of academia in this case, and in this case, this is professorships at UC Berkeley and professorships at, um, at Cornell, so those are not trivial institutions has always championed zoos as having the potential to be centers of conservation and research. Some zoos stepped up to the plate, some zoos have not. But all zoos, except for the very smallest one perhaps, have the potential. And Harry's always believed in that. And in fact, his ties with uh, Zoo Atlanta go back about 30 years when he was doing his doctoral dissertation up the road, so to speak, at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He needed to observe a very broad variety of snakes doing what they do, which is eat things. And you can't do that in the field, especially without tens of thousands of dollars of travel money. So he did it in zoos, Zoo Atlanta, Forward Zoo, and Dallas Zoo. And so back in Zoo Atlanta's history, we were one of the, uh, probably one of the first, certainly not the first, institution to really help bridge this academic and zoo, and zoo institution uh, of the ASLM. So Harry and the, the administration at that time really helped broker that. So his connection with Zoo Atlanta is real, and uh, his connection with zoos in general and conservation and research in general are very, very real. And so because natural history and appreciation for nature, which on this audience is, is, is a given, but on some audience this is not, is going to uh, walk us through a reminder and maybe a different perspective on why we appreciate nature tonight. So I'm extremely excited to welcome Harry Green to Zoo Atlanta tonight. Thanks very much. I'm really happy to be back in Zoo Atlanta. I, I recognized individual chunks of concrete and strange back doors and rental houses and stuff like that today. Uh, everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to try to remember to stay here in front of the lights this time. I, I kept sneaking out of the view of the video camera earlier today and I tried to be better about that. Also, before I get started, I want to tell you I have a door prize. This is a very special uh, poster. It was a promotion poster for a book I wrote. It's a real piece of art. It's a Michael and Patricia Fogden photograph of a yellow-bellied sea snake in the Pacific off the coast of Costa Rica. Very nice poster. And I'm going to mention a song at some point during my talk tonight. And the first person who can tell me the people that sing this song, I'll give you the poster. <laughs> so uh, here's where we're going. I'm going to. First, tell you, first quote, uh, pose this question why should we care about nature? I'm going to suggest there are several reasons, and I'm going to talk about one in particular tonight the aesthetic appreciation of nature. I'm going to suggest that the insights of two great thinkers of the past, Charles Darwin and Immanuel Kant, uh, provide some insights into how and why we might appreciate nature beyond just the sort of aesthetics, the beauty of individual organisms. I'm going to illustrate this with three groups of organisms. First, there'll be a really short example involving a very large Georgia alligator. Uh, then I'll talk some about frogs and the diversity of frogs and frog biology. And then I'll talk about snakes and the diversity of snake biology. And in each of these three examples, I'd like you to think about how we might view particular organisms and appreciate them in a context much broader than whether or not we would think that individual organism is attractive or not. Well, uh, why does this all matter? And uh, this is an especially good institution to pose the question, what's happening to amphibians and why should we care about that? Should we be worried? The frog pair on the left 
are golden toads from the Monte Verde Forest Preserve. This species was discovered as new to science in the early 1960s by a man named Jay Savage. And at that time, it was so incongruous to see a bright orange toad on a dark tropical forest floor that when Jay Savage walked into the Monte Verde Cloud Forest and saw the breeding aggregation of Buffalo Peregrinis, he seriously thought that his graduate students were playing a hoax on him. He, he seriously entertained the possibility that his graduate students do things like this. <laughs> he seriously entertained the possibility that these were painted toads. They were described as a new species in 1968, and by the early 1990s, Buffalo Peregrinis was extinct. Now, there are various ironies to this fact. One is that Buffalo Peregrinis went extinct in a nature preserve, and I think that's really frightening. So Buffalo Peregrinis did not go extinct because of overt habitat destruction, did not go extinct because of collection from the pet trade, persecution because we don't like golden toads, didn't go extinct because of collection from the leather trade. None of those reasons. It just slipped off the face of the earth as a result of something or some things that we didn't understand. Another little irony about it is that a zoo actually requested permission to collect several pairs of Buffalo Peregrinis in the late 1970s. It was a zoo that had already distinguished itself as a breeding center for endangered toads. And it was refused permission to remove six or eight pairs of Buffalo Peregrinis to the, from the wild to Toronto. Uh, well, it's only just sort of matter of fact grounds. We don't think that's an appropriate thing to do with our toads. And there's certainly an irony in the fact that this animal is now extinct now, and there's no possibility of ever putting it back on Earth. Unlike, for example, these uh, lemur leaf frogs on the right, uh, which were photographed right here in Atlanta, thanks to the joint program between Atlanta Botanical Garden and Zoo Atlanta. Well, I think when you look at these animals, it's easy to perceive them as beautiful. At least I think these are, these are as individual organisms, beautiful just to the point of magic. Okay. Um, but I work with snakes, and that's not always the case with snakes, though everybody loves snakes. Um, and I've come to believe that education is just huge in all of this. I think that we can all be teachers, whether we're mechanics or bus drivers or professors in universities or docents in zoos. No question that education is really huge, but I've come to become more interested lately in exactly how does that work. And what is it we tell people, and why does teaching people about things help them appreciate things more? You can't read this, I don't think, but I'm going to tell you what this says. This is a sign at the Bronx Zoo. It has a quote from a Senegalese conservationist named Baba Dilun, and it says, We will only conserve what we love, we will only love what we understand, and we will only understand what we are taught. And I think this is a very important set of relationships among doing research and finding out new things about organisms, teaching those new facts to people, and then us collectively as a society using this information to appreciate and manage the world around us. I think this sort of interrelated uh, connection among research, teaching, and, and uh, conservation is absolutely critical for the future of wildlife on Earth. So, here's the problem though. Not everybody thinks this is beautiful. This is a large, stout-bodied pit viper in Brazil. It's in a place called Serra de Canastra National Park in sort of a Great Plains-like habitat. Uh, when I came around the corner of this red dirt road and saw this big black and silver viper uh, stretched out and mobile in front of me, it was just one of the highlights of my life. I mean, it was one of the most stunning things I've ever seen. I'd never seen a species in the field at that time, and it wasn't only a Bothrops alternatus, it was a huge female, and she was freshly shed with the beautiful alternating silver markings, and she snapped into this defensive posture. It's just a wonderful thing, but not everybody would have the same response to that same <laughs> In fact, our buddy Charles Darwin encountered a very close relative of the snake, both Rob Samuel and Toides in uh, Patagonia, and this is what he said about it. The expression on the snake's face was hideous and fierce. I do not think I ever saw anything more ugly. So, so much for Charles Darwin's aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is the issue, you know. We can look at this and we can argue about whether or not this is pretty, but can we go beyond notions of attractiveness and sort of emotional responses to the properties of individual organisms. Oops, I've, I've, I'm still getting used to the fact there are two different ways to change this. Sorry about that. Well, uh, I'm going to suggest a couple of uh, solutions to this problem, or just insights to this problem that I think come from these two great thinkers, Darwin and Kant. Let's talk about Darwin a little bit first. Here's a quote from the final pages of Origin of Species. There's grandeur in this view of life that whilst the planet is gone circling on according to the law of gravity, from so simple beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have evolved. 
very prosaic words. This is a phrase from Darwin, descent with modification. It's a beautiful summing up of the basic conclusion that, that life has a history. Uh, when we look around us, everything we see is interconnected through time. Okay? Everything's descended from something else, and over the course of the history of this descent, you see modification and diversification. That was Darwin's really great insight, I think, even beyond the specific causes like things like natural selection. Because it leads us to think about words like this, ancestry, pedigree, lineage, legacy, inheritance, heritage, all words that we associate with valuing things, with caring about things, with having pride in things, okay? Now, I teach uh, non-majors introductory biology to 450 freshmen every fall. I don't know if you can imagine what that's like to, to step out in front of 450 17-year-olds that are daring you to bore them. It is, it's a staggering, a staggering feeling those first few days, you know? And I have to teach them about things like these, and, this, and these are non-majors. Most of my students are business majors. And what I've found is that before you sort of jump into the sort of continuity of all life in terms of evolutionary descent and ancestry and heritage and so forth, it's useful to give people an example that fits with something they're a little more familiar with, like a human family tree. So here's a human family tree. If you start down here with my brother Will and I, or my friend Gabriela Parr from Mexico and her brother, we all have ancestors from whom we're descended. And you can now actually, thanks to Google and other sources, you can trace your ancestry back quite a ways. And you can keep going back through time. And my ancestry traces back to a man named Nathaniel Green, one of the early English colonists. And of course, ultimately, you can trace me back to European ancestors. You can do the same thing for Gabriela, but her ancestry goes back through Cortez and Hernandez and various Spanish colonists. So I always ask my freshmen, when do you think the most recent common ancestor was of Gabriella and me? And they ponder for a little bit, and finally somebody gets up the courage and raises their hand, and they realize that the most recently Gabriella and I could have had a common ancestor had to have been more than 500 years ago when Spaniards and Europeans and, and English colonists both came to the New World. And in fact, uh, I don't know how long ago the Spaniards and the British fused in human history, but it had to be many centuries before 500 years ago. In other words, this is this notion of legacy, of lineage, and fusing lineages into ancestors. The convention with human family trees is to put the past at the top and the present at the bottom, whereas with evolutionary trees, we put the past at the bottom and the present at the top. So here's an evolutionary tree of some organisms you're likely familiar with, turtles, lizards, snakes, this somewhat lizard-like creature found only on a few islands off the coast of New Zealand called the Tuatara, alligators and crocodiles, and birds. And these are the evolutionary relationships among these organisms. And what this tree tells us, or illustrates for us, is that a very long time ago, hundreds of million years ago, there was an ancestral reptile. And it diverged at some point, and the two living lineages of that early divergence of ancestral reptiles are the turtles and everybody else. And everybody else, somewhat later, diverged into one lineage that leads to lizards and snakes and to a terrace. And the other lineage led to crocodiles and alligators and dinosaurs and birds and pterosaurs and so forth, the so-called archosaurs, okay? And each of these living groups bears the mark of the heritage of these larger groups, okay? Here's a, I'll just show you one more tree, which is my freshman biology textbook, as a matter of fact. And vertebrates start right here, so all these organisms encompassed in this part of this tree are what we call vertebrates. And they all share the heritage of having a backbone, a bony vertebral column. Within them, there are sharks and rays, and there's everybody else. And each of these everybody else groups, these successive groups of organisms, are characterized by things. So a group called tetrapods all share the presence of four legs. A group called mammals, which we're part of, all share the presence of fur, mammary glands, and so forth. Okay? All this involves heritage. Okay, now, what about this German philosopher? I want to tell you right away that I thought about reading Immanuel Kant when I got interested in this, and I spent about six minutes thinking about it. <laughs> okay. I checked Critica, a translation of Critique of Judgment out of the library. Immanuel Kant was a, a late 18th century German philosopher, so he originally wrote in German. Uh, archaic German was very stodgy, translated, it's very stodgy. Uh, I do not, I am not familiar with the jargon of philosophy, and I quickly gave up on reading Ron Wilcom. So what I'm going to say is actually based on a very interesting paper by a man named Ross Keister, who's an ecologist from the U.S. Forest Service. 
Uh, his paper was published 10 years ago in a somewhat obscure journal called Ecolo Human Ecology Review. If you'd like to see this, if you send me an email, I'll send you a PDF of this paper. What Ross Keister did, because he's smart enough to read Kant, was look at Kant's discussion of aesthetics and apply it to biodiversity. So that's what I want to spend about three or four minutes here, sort of talking you through it, a really interesting distinction Kant made about aesthetics. He said that the beautiful in nature concerns the form of the object, which consists in the objects being bounded. Now that's a little awkward, but here's what he's really getting at. Beauty is something that you look at something and you just appreciate it without further context. So you could, you could look at this thing right here and ask yourself whether it's attractive or not. You could look at two different people and ask whether you find one beautiful or the other not. You could look at a viper and I might find it beautiful and you might not. But in every case, what we're doing is just applying whatever our preconceptions to are, and we're looking at some object, and we're having a response to it, an emotional response. In contrast, Kant talked about the sublime in terms of the contemplation of objects that are formless and unbounded and that strike the imagination in a particularly powerful way. What he's talking about is that sublime appreciation depends on additional information. I'm going to show you examples of this involving biodiversity. In other words, to sort of take, based on Ross Keister, what Kant said, Beauty is something that characterizes an organism, an individual, whereas sublime aesthetics transcend individuals to encompass their shared evolutionary natural history. In other words, we can appreciate things beyond just what we see in the absence of any further information. When we have further information about the heritage of organisms, their natural history, and so forth, it enhances, sometimes tremendously enhances, how we feel about them and how much value we place in them. Just a little bit more about Kant's aesthetics. He actually made a distinction between what he called mathematically sublime and dynamically sublime. And it turns out to be kind of interesting with respect to biodiversity. The mathematically sublime applies to magnitude, immensity, sheer numbers. And I'll give you an example of that involving frogs. He said that contemplation of violent storms, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions are examples of dynamically sublime experiences. So, so think about if you were on the slope of a volcano when it went off. You would have a, an emotional reaction that, that in some sense was due to just the sheer power of it all, right? And that's a sublime aesthetic reaction, not just a matter of beauty. And what I'm going to argue and what uh, Keister got me thinking about is that we can combine Darwin and Kant for appreciating nature. So evolutionary heritage and natural history inspire a biologically sublime aesthetics, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my talk. And I'm going to use three examples, as I said. First, I'm going to talk a little about this big alligator from uh, the Harris Neck National Wildlife Refuge, which I understand is near Savannah. I've never been there. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about frogs and a little bit more about snakes. Uh, and I'm wondering, in this light, can you see these pictures? Hmm. What? What's the can we get the lights for just a second? Yeah. These pictures are amazing. <laughs> if, we can, if we can turn the lights down briefly. That would be great. Are you guys comfortable with this? Mm -hmm. You're not going to fall asleep on me, are you? <laughs> okay. This is wonderful if uh, you don't mind, because it's the pictures that really matter. So uh, this is an example, actually, of funny things that happened on the internet. I started getting these one week. Friends started sending me these pictures. And when I first got them, they were supposedly taken by a guy from Texas who took them in South and North Carolina. And I, I didn't believe the North Carolina part. And, and I don't like to use photographs in my classes without attributing them to people. So I started making phone calls. I started with Whit Gibbons at Savannah River Ecology Lab. And, uh, about four phone calls later, I talked to the woman who actually took these pictures, her name is Karen Jenkins. She's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Fire Control Officer, and her job is to fly in a helicopter over remote Georgia swamps and look for fires. And she took these pictures from a helicopter. You can see the rotor uh, impact on the, on the surface of the water. This is a big American alligator carrying an adult white-tailed deer in its jaw. Okay. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at this, I think several things happen a little bit subconsciously. My mind says, wow, that's really cool that alligator's got a big deer. And then my mind says, wow, white-tailed deer is about that high at the shoulder, weighs about 100 to 200 pounds. That is a huge alligator. <laughs> okay? Maybe the brain is even a little more off-color than that, you know, and thinking about just how big this alligator is. That's an enormous alligator. In fact, when I talked to Terry Jenkins on the phone, she said that she has seen alligators in these remote swamps 
bigger than she's ever seen in any zoo, bigger than she's ever seen in more accessible localities. She told me she believes there are enormous alligators in Georgia in places you simply can't get to except in a helicopter. Okay. So I showed this picture in my class, and I asked, after talking about Darwin and Kant to my herpetology course, I asked them, what kind of sublime aesthetics do you think are being illustrated here? And one thing my students always say is dynamically sublime. I mean, that, that is a really impressive alligator, but what impresses you is when you have this context, and you think about this enormous archosaur out there in that water with a full-grown white-tailed deer subdued in its jaws, okay? The other thing is, I really like to remind people, this animal is not nearly as closely related to a lizard as it is to a bird, to a bird, okay? That's a bitter pill for some ornithologist to swallow. But yeah. simply, it's simply the truth, and we've known it for over a century. You can argue about whether the closest extinct relatives of birds are T. rex and fellow dinosaurs or not, but no one has disagreed seriously for more than a century that the closest living relatives of birds are alligators. Now, it was a little hard to believe a century ago, before we knew that all living crocodilians have billed nests, all living crocodilians have parental attendance of their young, all living crocodilians have acoustic communication between their babies and their parents. Crocodilians do incredibly smart things. Crocodilians are actually like birds in lots of ways, but they're not like lizards and snakes and turtles and so forth. So there's certainly a sense in which we can think of this huge alligator and its kin and its natural history in terms of biologically sublime aesthetics. And now I want to switch to frogs, spend a little bit more time on this. There are actually more described species of frogs than there are mammals. Don't pay any attention to this taxonomy over here. I'd simply like you to know that we have some information about the relationships among these 5,300 <coughs> currently 62 described species of frogs. They're extremely diverse in various ways, and yet they're all built on a fundamental frog body plan. Okay. This is what I call the fundamental frogginess of frogs. Okay. <laughs> frogs, in spite of all the diversity in them, and we'll emphasize that a little more in just a minute, but in spite of all this variation in reproductive biology, escape behavior, feeding behavior, size, color, et cetera, they are all fundamentally jumping machines. What frogs did a very long time ago, almost 200 million years ago, was to redesign themselves, especially their back end, into a jumping machine. They lost their tail, they shortened their vertebral column, they made it very rigid, they made their front end like a pointy end of a projectile, and they reorganized their back end so that they're essentially a five-length folded up jumping machine. You might think that this is the middle of this frog's back right here, this bump. You know when a frog sits still, you can always see a bump, kind of an angled bump. That's not, that's not halfway down the back. That's the end of the back. Okay? These bumps right here on either side are the ends of the ilium, the upper ends of the pelvic girdle. So these bumps on a frog right here are what you can feel if you put your hand right here on you. Those are the ilium, part of the pelvis. And then frogs are like these two elongated rocks. And they connect with a projection that comes off the last vertebrae called a sacral diapothesis. And they, they link in a movable joint right there and right there. So when a frog is all sitting down, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do an imitation of a squatting frog. When a frog is sitting down, you have a bunch of folded up joints. You have one around where the pelvis connects to the backbone. You have another one where the pelvis connects to the uh, upper legs, the femurs. Here's the knee joint. Here's the lower leg, and then it's a little obscured in this picture, but the ankle is very long, and then the toes, okay? So you have one, two, three, four, five joints around which these long limbs are folded up, and there are muscles working around each of those joints. And unlike the situation in most vertebrate limbs where you, your muscles are kind of arranged in opposing pairs so that some of them mostly do this and some of them mostly do that, the musculature of a frog's rear end has been rearranged so that most of the forces associated with most of the muscles contracting send the frog out into space. The frog has very little ability to fold itself up. It doesn't need much. What it really wants to do is jump. Okay? And it does that, of course, superbly. Well, superimposed on this fundamental frogginess is enormous diversity. Okay? There are frogs that I like to tell my class, there are frogs that give birth out of every conceivable orifice and some you've never thought of. <laughs> there are frogs, there are actually frogs, or at least there used to be until recently, frogs that ingest their eggs, the stomach shuts down, the stomach acts like a uterus, and the female eventually regurgitates the newborn young. There is a frog in Chile, which gives us a wonderful 
the challenging concept of a pregnant male. Okay? Darwin's frog, the male ingests the eggs, they go into his vocal pouch, and they go all the way through to the little frog stage in the male's vocal pouch, and he regurgitates or gives birth through his mouth, through his frog. Okay? There are marsupial frogs that put the eggs in their back. It just goes on and on. There are frogs like these leaf frogs right here, these right here, these right here, that lay their eggs on leaves overhanging water. Development happens up in the air on a leaf, and then the tadpoles drop into the water. It just goes on and on and on. And yet all of this is imposed on this fundamental frogginess, this legacy of building your body into a jumping machine. And I think we can illustrate at least a couple of kinds of sublime aesthetics here. I think this actually illustrates mathematical sublimity. There is something like, I'm not sure of the exact count now, but there are somewhere between 25 and 30 species of frogs in the whole state of California. California is a complex state. It's a big state. It's topographically complicated. It goes from, you know, 9,000 feet to sea level and below. It's got all kinds of plant zones, lots of climatic variations, da 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 and There's about 25 to 30 species of frogs. You can find 30 species of frogs at a Sahara site in southwestern Brazil, about the size of the Atlanta airport. Okay? You can find as many species of frogs almost in one pond in one night in a Sahara site in Brazil as the entire state of California. <laughs> if you're standing out in one pond in one night, you could see all these and more breeding in one pond. So you can see there's a tree frog, this is a tiny tree frog, this is a big tree frog, a medium tree frog, colorful tree frogs, here's a left tobacco that with fake eyes on its rear end, here's a left tobacco that makes a, a foam nest like meringue, okay. here's a toad that looks like a toad except about the size of a dachshund. <laughs> Tremendous diversity. And you can be standing in this pond with headlamp on and look around you and there just be different frog after different frog after different frog. And I think part of the aesthetic experience you had, part of the emotional impact this would have on you, would come from the sheer numbers of frogs and the numbers of different kinds of frogs. And then if you pause and remember, they're all frogs. They're all descendants of this amazing invention almost 200 million years ago of the frog jumping machine. We can even push the sort of evolutionary heritage thing just a little farther. These are some representative frogs, and this is a very simplified, pruned evolutionary tree of frogs. Okay? So there really should be many more branches on the true evolutionary tree of frogs. After all, we have more than 5,000 species. But I'd like to call your attention to this one right here. This is called a tail frog. It's a little, actually a very nondescript looking brown frog in many respects. There are two things that are special about it that are easy to see or easy to know about. One is this thing right here, which is why it's called a tail frog. That's not a real tail. It's an irreversible part of its cloaca, its vent. And it's used in the males to transfer sperm because these frogs live in fast-moving streams. And if they try external fertilization like most frogs do, the sperm would simply wash into the Pacific Ocean. So we have this internal fertilization mechanism. This frog's restricted to just the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. and southwestern Canada. But what we know from studies of bones, from studies of chromosomes, from DNA sequencing and so forth, is that the oldest divergence among all living frogs is between that species and everybody else. Okay. In other words, this right here, this divergence right here, happened over 150 million years ago in terms of living frogs. So when I lived in Berkeley and when I taught herpetology in Berkeley, we had a field trip to the redwoods of Mendocino County, and we could predictably find tail frogs. And of course, I would teach the students about this legacy of tail frogs before we went on the field trip. And I was once standing next to my students in a ravine of redwood trees with a live tail frog in somebody's hand. And I heard my students say, wow, the last time this frog shared its genes with any other species on Earth was 150 million years ago. Okay. The students were obviously awed by what they perceived as the significance of this frog. And superficially, it just looks like a little brown frog. Okay? The aesthetic experience is enhanced by knowing more about the frog's evolutionary relationships. Uh, the last two pictures, the last thing I want to say about frogs, I, I sort of invented a term, magical sublimity, because I'm going to show you three pictures that I took just last January when I was in the Pantanal in southwestern Brazil that really shocked me. I was with some Brazilian biologists and my wife, all of whom study Brazilian frogs. And uh, one night, one of the Brazilians, Sincha Prado, and I were standing next to a small pond. And Sincha had worked on this species, Leptodactylus pedicipinus, for her PhD. And she had discovered that it has parental care, that the female remains with the, with the nest during 
uh, development of the eggs and then stays with the tadpoles uh, during their development until they metamorph into little froglets. But she, had, and she even knew, she had some observations of the female moving the tadpoles throughout the pond, but she didn't know why they moved them. And since she and I were squatted down in the dark and I'd start taking photographs, the initial view we had was not of the tadpoles spread out, they were all in a black mass, about a foot in diameter or a little more, and the female was standing, sitting nearby in the grass. And while we were watching these frogs, Cynthia suddenly said, oh, a snake. And a water snake came from the left and started eating the tadpoles. So I couldn't resist. I grabbed the snake, we picked it up, we photographed the tadpoles in its mouth. And when we looked back down, the female frog had taken off. And in the next 20 minutes, the female moved her tadpoles 12 yards to the right along the bank of the pond in the opposite direction from which the snake came. And it was very dramatic. She, she would take off, making these little kicking movements with her hind legs. The tadpoles swarmed. There's several hundred tadpoles here. We get all stretched out. She would stop, raise her rear end up in the air, and make some funny little vibrating movements. We don't know whether she was sending out acoustic cues or spreading a chemical. We don't know exactly what was happening. But the fact was, she would sit there and do this for a while, and then the tadpoles would catch up with her. And then she'd strike out again. And in 20 minutes, she led those frogs 12 yards in the opposite direction from the snake. Now, I don't know if you find that exciting. I mean, when I was a grad student in the mid-70s, this was inconceivable. <coughs> Nobody had any idea that frogs did things like that. And now we're finding out that the lives of frogs are far richer than we realize. The next night, there's a dirt road that goes across the Pantanal, and we just were out driving on it looking for wildlife. And within about an hour, we encountered three groups of capybara, these giant roads, giant aquatic roads, three family groups of capybara sitting in the dark at the side of this little dirt road right next to the water. So the Pantanal is just an enormous flooded grassland, much like the Everglades. And each of these three groups of capybara, there would be a male, a female, and some young, and each of the three groups of capybara were surrounded by frogs. The frog we found surrounding these capybaras is called Leptodactylus chakensis. It's the same, it's a relative of this, but a little bigger. It looks a lot like a leopard frog. I photographed each group, and when I get out of the truck and try to get closer, the capybara run away. But here's one of the pictures. This is a Leptodactylus right here. These are capybara. Here's a Leptodactylus. This is a Leptodactylus sitting on the back of this capybara. Okay? And while I watched that frog, it hopped around the back of that capybara. Three times in one minute, I saw its pink tongue flick out as it tried to eat insects. I couldn't, I can't tell you that I saw it catch insects, but I could see insects just swarming over the capybara, and I saw this frog hopping around the back of the capybara, flipping out its tongue. And the capybara were absolutely mobile the whole time. I mean, do you think this is surprising? That was absolutely dumb. I mean, I don't think, if you saw ox crackers doing this in the rhino, you wouldn't even blink to call this a mutualistic association a grooming symbiosis involving a bird and a, and a mammal. I've actually showed it to ornithologists, and they always go, well, I don't know, it's a frog, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is a frog. Isn't it incredible what it's doing? I mean, and nobody had ever seen this before. Just amazing. Okay. Let's switch to snakes. <laughs> uh, one thing that's fascinated me for a long time, especially as somebody who's phobic, I'm, I'm a, I forget what fear of heights is called, hepatophobic, agoraphobic or something like that. Anyway, I'm also fairly severely arachnophobic, which is just a tad ironic since I've worked with venomous snakes most of my life, but I'm really freaked out by big spiders. <laughs> especially big spiders that show up on my back or in my head or whatever unexpectedly. I, I pretty much am gone. Uh, you know, I've had big snakes crawl, you know, venomous snakes suddenly crawling on me. I don't, I don't flip out of the fat the spiders get me. So it's fascinating that our response to snakes is kind of bipolar. You know, it's, it's very ambivalent. We don't just hate them because many cultures also deify them. We're not just sort of grossed out by them. We're also fascinated by them. And uh, some time back, I began to wonder about why we have this really strongly ambivalent response to snakes. And I started collecting anecdotes of predation on snakes and predation by snakes. Actually, it wasn't just anecdotes. I did a huge survey of the literature of things that eat snakes and things that snakes eat. And one of the things I found out is that every major lineage of primate both eats snakes and gets eaten by snakes. Okay. 
So for example, I have records of particularly pythons eating tarsiers. And here's a tarsier eating a deadly Asian coral snake of the genus Matacora. Okay? This, is take, this picture is taken in the field by a guy's petting tarsier. At the same time, I found records of snakes eating every major group of primates. So, for example, in Madagascar, the Madagascan tree boa, Sanzania madagascariensis, eats half a lemur, a gray lemur. Probably eats other lemurs as well. There are records of snakes eating tarsiers, lemurs, old world monkeys, new world monkeys, gibbons, and even people. Okay? Now, this people thing is kind of interesting because right now, most of what we know about snakes eating people is super anecdotal, much of a suspect, and it's entirely based on incidents involving rural people in relatively civilized cultures. Right after I moved to Cornell eight years ago, through a somewhat complex series of coincidences, I was sent this photograph. And it just stunned me. It, it excited me so much I tracked down the guy who took it. His name's Tom Hedlund. And it turned out that Tom Hedlund and his wife are anthropologists who studied Agatha Negritos in the Philippines in the late 60s and early 70s. They worked with Agatha Negritos when these people were still preliterate, small group hunter gatherers. Okay? These people were living about as close as you could hope to study to sort of prehistoric humans. Okay? They did have knives and they did have homemade shotguns, but they were preliterate, they lived in small groups, and they lived mainly on wild game, which they hunted and killed. And Tom was actually out with them one day when they found and very excitedly killed this 26-foot female, particularly python, which they then butchered and retrieved something like 50, 60 pounds of meat from and, and all spent quite a lot of time eating. Now, interestingly, Tom conducted ethnographic surveys of about 120 of these people, and he discovered that 26% of the adult males had survived predatory attacks by particularly pythons, and 82% of those people had big scars to prove that they had survived these predatory attacks. In the collective memory of these 120 active negritos, there were six fatalities. People actually killed and eaten by reticulated python, two of which happened to children while Tom was living with the group. Okay? So these are the first available quantitative data on the incidence of giant snake predation on people. It's an amazing data set. And this guy Hedlund didn't actually know that it would be that exciting. So you can imagine, I kind of went nuts over this, and uh, we were writing it up and publishing it. I think the bottom line, though, is it's clear our ambivalence about snakes has very ancient roots. I think it must go back to the fact that very early in our heritage as primates, because giant snakes are certainly evolutionarily older than primates, but since long before we were human, even long before there were monkeys as we know them today, early in the history of primates, snakes represented both a very easily dispatchable and puzzling source of protein around out in legs and things like that. And at the same time, a potential source of horrific mortality, okay? So I think it's a very ancient thing in our history to have this, this sort of bivalent response to snakes. And that, that helps to explain why it's, it's such, a, such a challenge to get people to care about snakes. Well, one of the things I found to be really useful in getting people to care about snakes is being able to introduce snakes to people as individual organisms with complex lives. And our ability to do that was really revolutionized about 25 years ago by the invention of miniaturized radio telemetry and a surgical method for putting a transmitter in a snake. And I'm not the one who invented this, and I'm certainly not the only one to do this kind of research. But with a Tucson physician, who was my collaborator for 15 years, we studied this species, the black-tailed rattlesnake, in the Chiricahua Mountains of southeastern Arizona for 15 years. And in the course of that study, we had more than 4,000 encounters with 50 radio telemeter black tail rattlesnakes. And we chose this species because it's relatively large, it can take the surgery and the transmitter without any problem. The big male's about four feet long and weighs about two pounds. The female's about three feet long and weighs about half that much in the year that she is really fat enough to be produced. I'll just show you a few slides from the study to kind of illustrate how we can use natural history to enhance appreciation for snakes. Uh, first, I really want to stress that um, I think there's very strong evidence now that the old macho way of handling snakes is really bad for snakes, in addition to being really risky for people. So because we were anxious to have many encounters with individual snakes, uh, we were at pains to never traumatize these animals. So we never manually restrained them. We never mashed their heads down with a snake stick. 
We did everything under anesthesia. Turns out the same vapor anesthetics that work well in people work very well in vipers. And so when we found a snake, I would gently uh, catch it with a snake hook and, and lift it into a container, take it back to the garage apartment that we used as a field lab just a few miles away. Under vapor anesthetic, uh, incision we made in the body cavity, a commercially available transmitter that's about the size and weight of a lipstick container would be implanted in the body cavity. This transmitter, this particular transmitter has a life, a battery life of about 22 months. Transmits for up to about a mile under ideal conditions. And at the end of the uh, 18 to 20 months, if we wanted to keep that animal in the study, we just bring it back in the lab, essentially replace its batteries and put it back out for another two years. Uh, you've probably seen uh, telemetry illustrated before. The receiver is a very small package you wear around your neck or on your belt, and the antenna looks like a, a small antenna. And basically, uh, every snake in your study at any particular time is, is broadcasting a different radio frequency. So if you want to find mail number nine, you just put in his number and hold the antenna up, and if Joe's mail number nine, you'll hear beep, 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 beep. When you start walking in this direction, as you get closer, you periodically point the antenna down because you don't want to hear it get louder <laughs> right on your feet. And the whole goal is to approach the animal without scaring it. So, for example, we usually would approach in the morning from the west so that we would not cast a shadow on the snake and scare it. We would try to spot it ahead of time so we could make observations through binoculars, take pictures, and so forth. The other thing I want to say about this is this is the only, only picture you're going to see that looks like this. I think this is how most people probably think of rattlesnakes. I almost never see rattlesnakes like this. Because I don't, I don't bother them. Okay. We took an old rancher out one time. He asked to go out and see our snakes, and he had been bragging about how he killed every rattlesnake he'd ever seen in his life. So we took him out and used an antenna, and we found male number nine. We said, "Well, there he is under that prickly pear." He said, "Well, how come he's not rattling?" I said, "Well, you're not throwing rocks at him." <laughs> and then we, you know, we, we dialed up female twenty-one, and there she was sitting under a little ledge. And he said, "There she is, family. She's under that ledge." And he goes, "Well, how come she's not trying to bite us?" Well, you're not beating her with a stick. <laughs> Went on like that all morning. Every rattlesnake we showed him was behaving differently than every rattlesnake he'd ever seen in his life. That's because every rattlesnake he ever saw was very quickly harassed him and killed. And we almost never see snakes like this, and that's how we want it to be. Uh, one of the great advantages of radio telemetry is that you can find these animals in places where you aren't expecting them. So instead of finding them just where you think they are, you find them all the places they really are. This is female 21, about three feet up from the juniper tree. And actually, I took this picture after having spent a very frustrating 20 minutes walking around around this juniper tree, <laughs> <laughs> presuming that she was on the ground, not being able to see her. I finally decided she must be under the leaf litter in the duck under this tree. So I took the antenna off. I was using the cable end as a short distance antenna. And I was very carefully, with my hands and knees, creeping around under this tree, holding the antenna over the leaf litter, trying to find out where 21 might be. And finally, I just couldn't find her. And I was really frustrated and disgusted. So I sat up, and I was sitting on the tree. Actually, I was remembering the notion of a gumption trap from that book, Sin in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I was thinking, I am in a gumption trap. Yeah. I'm doing something really stupid, and I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I tilted my head slightly to the left, and I saw female 21 right next to my face. <laughs> Here's her hand right here. She was coiled on a swim. She didn't so much as tongue flick, not so much as a, -ch 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 a rattle. No aggressive defensive behavior. Just sat there, very comfortable in her camouflage. No problem. Uh, and I learned that black tails like to climb. <laughs> yeah. uh, we discovered, we, we studied their diet. We're looking at the stomachs of road kills. Occasionally they defecate while they're under anesthesia. We look at their feces. We made a few uh, observations of feeding in the field. It turns out this particular species feeds entirely on mammals, especially wood rats, as shown here, but also cottontail rabbits, rock squirrels, and chipmunks. They're a really interesting social system. It turns out for most rattlesnakes, the female can't accumulate enough food during a single season to breed every year. So in most species of rattlesnakes in the U.S., the female only reproduces about every second or third year. During any one breeding season, all the males are ready to go. So this sets up a situation where if the sex ratio is identical, you have maybe half or the third of the females receptive that year and all the males wanting to mate. So what happens in late summer in the Chiricahuas, which is the breeding season, the males basically stop feeding for about a month. And they spend all their time making these long distance movements, sometimes uh, six, seven, eight hundred yards in a day or two. 
in which they just crawl in these straight lines and they try to intercept the chemical trails of females. And when they find them, they trail a female, they court her for hours or even days. If another male comes by, they engage in this combat behavior, which is essentially an arm wrestling match involving their heads and necks. Uh, pretty quickly, one of the other the males repeatedly pushes the other one down. The loser leaves and the winner goes back to courting the female, which sometimes is successful and sometimes isn't. The most exciting thing we discovered, and we, we had many wonderful things happen to us in the course of this 15-year study, but the most exciting thing we discovered is that these snakes have parental care. Now, it turns out, after we discovered this, we're looking at these live animals in the field, it turned out there are actually quite a few observations in the literature of people, including me, embarrassingly, finding female rattlesnakes in the wild with their young, even noting that the babies had cloudy skin, which means they're in a shed cycle, and they are not newborn, they are several days old, and not attributing this to parental care because we know that snakes are too stupid and too simple, etc., to do anything like that. So what happened is when you have a radio in these females, you can find them even during this extremely secretive period when they're grabbing, when they're gestating, and then when they're with their babies attending them for about 10 days after birth. This is female 21 again. That's my favorite snake in the whole world. <laughs> Uh, we had a total of 569 observations of her over a 12-year period. Her radio just burned out this last year, and uh, hopefully she's doing fine out there. She's just not being watched by us anymore. Over a 12-year period, we got to observe her over three different litters. We uh, nicknamed her Super Female because she was the best mom. She gave birth to the biggest, most frequent, and, and, and most numerous litters of babies. She was the best hunter in the population. We saw her the large food bulge more frequently than any other snake in the study, and she stayed out of trouble. We never, I don't think I ever heard that snake rattle in 12 years. So she's super female because she's a good mom, great hunter, stays out of trouble. <laughs> uh, after we made these observations, what happens is that after birth, instead of dispersing, the babies remain with the female. We did experiments with captive pygmy rattlesnakes that shows that they're mutually attracted to each other during this period until the babies shed their first skin, and then the attraction completely disappears. What we observed in the field is that every morning female 21 and the other snakes, the other pregnant females as well, would emerge from their hiding place, usually a rock squirrel burrow. The babies would come out with them and bask in the sun. If you got too close, the babies would zip into the hole and the female would back in after them rattling. In one case, the female would actually advance on a person if you got too close. It was very uncharacteristic of the species and only happens when they're attending their babies. And then in the case of this snake, we actually were present and were able to take video and still photos of her very carefully watching her baby shed their skin. So what happened here is this is the first baby. It comes out, sheds its skin right from its mom, and the second baby comes out, and the third baby. And the six babies came out and shed their skin in front of their mom, and then the next day the babies have all dispersed. Female 21, who at that point had not eaten in about 11 months, is 40 yards away at a wood rat nest trying to get a meal. Well, how does this all translate into nature appreciation and conservation? Let me switch to timber rattlesnakes, uh, which were once one of the most abundant large predators in North America. There must have been tens of thousands of timber rattlesnakes in the eastern U.S. at the time of European colonization. Extremely widespread snake. Uh, big males can be five and a half feet long, weigh several pounds, eat prey as big as swamp rabbits and fox squirrels. Clearly an important part of their ecosystem. Interestingly, uh, these snakes were appreciated by some of the early colonists. Benjamin Franklin wrote a beautiful essay about the timber rattlesnake as, a, as an admirable creature. He was a little hyperbolic. He, he thought that all the rattles were 13-segment rattles, and he talked about how if you sit, split the 13 segments up, you hear 13, number of colonies, you know? If you, if you split the 13 up, they couldn't make any noise, but if they stuck together, they could defend themselves. <laughs> but he liked the snake. There's a very famous uh, Navy battle flag with an icon of a timber rattlesnake that says, don't tread on me, and so forth. Now, 200 years plus later, this snake is endangered in uh, most of the northeastern U.S., including New York, where I live. Well, about 15 years ago, when I still taught at Berkeley, Natalie Angier from the New York Times came to my lab because she was doing an article about pit vipers from the Science Times. And I was showing her a tooth rattlesnake and letting her touch it and so forth. And, as she put it, I traveled on and on about how lovely it was, and, and then uh, I told her that I had this pipe dream that someday people would actually sign up for eco-tours and go see timber rattlesnakes in the wild. And then what she wrote in her article in the New York Times was, ah, yes, get my travel agent. 
as in that'll be the day. <laughs> now I envision timber rattlesnakes for this sort of pipe cream because of this heritage in, in American history. Okay? I thought, wouldn't it be incredible if we sort of re-embraced this big predator and found ways to sort of coexist with it? Well, now we do, okay? Look at these people right here. They look like bird watchers except for one thing. You see what's different about them? You see why they don't look like bird watchers? They're looking down. That's right. <laughs> bird watchers are so incredible, they never see anything. <laughs> so uh, I work a lot with a group in upstate New York called the Finger Lakes Land Trust. It's sort of a regional version of the Nature Conservancy. Its main goal is to buy land and manage reserves to preserve uh, wild country in upstate New York. And Finger Lakes Land Trust bought a piece of property near Elmira, about 45 miles from where I live, which has one of the last two remaining timber rattlesnake den systems in that part of New York. The other piece, the other den system was already owned by the Nature Conservancy. So now both of these timber rattlesnake den populations are preserved. And Finger Lakes Land Trust has a program called Talks and Treks, in which someone gives a talk on Thursday night about a particular topic. And then on Saturday morning, you lead the people that come to the talk and sign up on a trek to go out and see things. So now one of our summer talks and treks is about timber rattlesnakes. <coughs> on a Thursday night, we give a group of people, about 15 to 20 people, we give them a lecture about timber rattlesnakes. We have a live animal we take out. We talk to them about how easy it is to avoid the dangers. We give them a picture show that sort of shows them the life of this animal, a lot like some of the pictures I just showed you about black-tailed rattlesnakes. And then on Saturday, we take them out. We know some places where it's really likely we'll find pregnant females or females with a newborn young, like this one right here. He's a baby in the rattlesnakes and the close their mom. And the wonderful thing is, you take these people out, we tell them in advance, the snake is not going to do anything. And we are not going to pick that snake up on the tail and say, oh, look how dangerous she is. Talk about that about we're going to stand at a respectful distance. We're going to look through binoculars. We're not going to disturb her. We're going to be respectful of this animal. And in fact, the snake does nothing. Okay? It, it doesn't do anything. They just get to watch it. And we get back to the parking lot at noon, and the people are just babbling about what a great morning it was. It wasn't it incredible? I can't wait to tell my husband. My son's going to be so proud of me. That was such a beautiful animal. Wasn't it cool how you could see the swollen skin because it was a pregnant female? On and on and on and on. Okay. So I hope I sort of convinced you that we can get beyond individuals and characteristics of individuals that we can use knowledge of these animals that we gain through research to sort of create a broader context in which we can more widely appreciate them. Uh, I've tried to sort of explain to you this notion of a biologically sublime aesthetics. I think that's what education is all about, including education in zoos. I want to just read you something in closing, and then I'd be glad to take questions. I want you to look at these pictures while I read you this. Until last January, I'd never seen a giant snake in the field. So I want to close by telling you about an encounter I had in January. This bigger picture is the swamp where I actually had the encounter. I took this photograph before it got dark and before I walked into the swamp. The snake I'm going to describe to you was at least this big. Okay, this is an Ashley, one of the study anacondas and Jesus Rivas' uh, Venezuela and Yano study of the species. This is a five meter plus female anaconda, something like 15 to 16 feet long. And as I'll describe to you, the snake I'm going to tell you about was at least as big and possibly bigger than this, but for reasons that will become clear, I don't have a picture of it. The Bronx Zoo Samantha, a wild caught reticulated python more than 25 feet long, had an enormous head and surely could have swallowed me. I was mesmerized by that wonderful snake, watched through the glass and imagined her moving through a Bornean forest like some immense, limitless caterpillar. What would it have been like in her world of mainly chemical, tactile, and infrared sensations with one's head so far from one's tail? I mean, really, think about it. What would it be like if your head was 25 feet in your face? <laughs> uh, and I wondered, what would it be like? What would her well, how would her well camouflage presence affect other creatures? What would it be like to live wild in a place with 25 foot snakes? Last January in a Brazilian palm swamp with my wife and her collaborators, I finally gained field experience with a giant serpent. They were collecting frogs, but my mind drifted to the following week when we head for a flood of savanna near the Bolivian border. The Pantanal is famously, famously rich in wildlife, and with access by boat and horseback, I hope for a yellow anaconda. Which incidentally you have an exhibit here. Mm -hmm. I hope for a yellow anaconda. I didn't expect a far heftier green anaconda, but even the smaller species might exceed the biggest snake I'd ever seen in nature. 
That 10-foot Costa Rican boa constrictor was impressive in bulk and surly demeanor, but hardly gigantic compared to some pythons and anacondas. Now I waded in knee-deep water, camera slung over shoulder, and consigned a frog to the plastic bag in my left hand. Fernando Zara, an entomologist whose fear of snakes exceeds my own fairly severe arachnophobia, walked ahead, and Natalia Ponsonato, an undergrad who had never seen a snake in the field, was off to Zara's left. The others were across open water and barely within earshot, as we all searched for coursing amphibians and swatted insects in the heavy night air. Our headlamp sliced back and forth through the swamp, its vegetation glistening under silver clouds and a poignantly full moon. I hummed a favorite song about digging up a diamond, rare and fine, and passed my light along the branches and grass blades, scanning for frogs to catch and spiders to avoid. Because I am clumsy, every few steps I can glance down for roots or a hole that might see me splashing. And suddenly there were staggered dark saucers winding past my boot, like brown leaves twisting in an odd current. That's what it looked like at first. I looked down, and I saw these lily cats going by my foot. After a dissonant second or two, my brain said, shouldn't lily pads be on the surface? Why are you moving? <laughs> then my brain flashed color pattern of huge green anaconda. As her tail came into view, I grabbed it with one hand, whereupon the snake jerked loose and reappeared in shallow several feet away. I took a few steps, placed my hands lightly around the massive undulating torso, and waited for an obvious taper. Then I seized the tail with both hands and pulled her up towards my waist. The next few seconds were chaotic, heavy with snaky unknowns. Zara slashed over to help, but my only plan was to pull the anaconda on the land, get a better look, and make another plan. <laughs> her torso glinted like a pole-shaped submarine parting the moonlit waters. Then she arced sideways, and I wondered if big toothy jaws were swinging her way. Instead, the snake, the snake strained forward, its tail slid on the bag in my left hand, and though I leaned back, although I leaned back hard, she pulled free and disappeared. Zara kept behind me as we searched for the spotted pattern, and I flinched when something bumped into my leg, as if visions of snake earth had already compromised our enthusiasm. We were both babbling. She was huge. Nossa Senhora, Harry, ela era enorme. <laughs> and Kelly called for us to hold it down, but they were recording a frog call. When I looked back towards where we'd entered the swamp, Natalia was cheerfully huddled on top of a fence post. I'm not really kidding. This woman was on top of that fence post. <laughs> like a little owl. <laughs> Zara and I agreed the anaconda was over 15 feet long because we saw more than four yards of body with no narrowing of four parts in sight. Neither of us ever saw her head. At least three inches separated my fingers and thumbs as the muscular trunk slid between them. And when I grasped the tail, just after feeling the dimple of her vent, my right thumb and forefinger did not meet. Her skin felt slick and tough, neither slimy nor cold, and then she moved with confidence, as if I were only a momentary distraction. My hopes for a yellow anaconda didn't pan out, but thanks to that magical evening, I more viscerally appreciate how a huge anaconda, easily identified in photographs, resembles in nature nothing so much as submerged leaves and inanimate cobbles. I know better why a deer or a monkey, or for that matter, a person at the water's edge, will not see her. There will be no sounds as she approaches, no scented warnings from upwind, and that sinuous surf surface ripple in the swamp grass might not be a storm's breezy prelude. Now I have an emotional sense of why complacency would not bode well in the home of giant serpents. Thank you. Thank you. I certainly had no intention 
of, of taking that snake out of that swamp. I just suddenly wanted to see her better. And I, I wanted to I wanted to know something more about that animal. So it all happened just like this. I mean, it was over in seconds. I I think that uh, subconsciously I did realize that it was not a stupid thing to do. I have seen a lot of uh, films of Jesus Rivas handling big anacondas in the field, and so I knew that's the reason why when I had her going through my hands, I was standing in water like this, and I was underwater, my hands were underwater, she was going through my hands. That's the reason I didn't, like, grab her and try to lift up, because I thought that would be very awkward <laughs> to, to lift this 15 or 20 foot snake up by the middle of the body, and I knew from watching Jesus' videos that that was probably not a good idea. So I just waited until her tail showed, and then I, I got her tail and just stood up like this, and I only had her for a short time. I might as well have been trying to hold my pickup, but uh, <laughs> there was actually no way that by myself I was getting that animal uh, out of the swamp. Yeah. Wow. I have a quick comment that uh, I, I learned a statistic from somebody on, uh, in, in our animal programs, and I don't remember uh, from who it was from, but the, uh, if you look at the attendance time of public that comes through ACA institutions, in other words, how long do they spend at different exhibits? The two major draws in terms of time they spend sitting in front of them are petting zoos and reptile houses. Mm -hmm. And think about what you said, I can't help but think that petting zoos is a connection mm -hmm. with goats or pigs or what have you. Yes. And, and reptile houses are just ambivalence that people are coming to grips with. Right, right. But that apparently is statistically borne out. Maybe someone else has the numbers behind that. But I learned that while I was here. <laughs> yes. Biology textbooks, at almost any level, have this nasty tendency of beginning with molecules yeah. or atoms, actually, and going up and up and up and yes. winding up with ecology. Yes. What kind of impact do you think that has, if it does, yes. on especially at the college level, right. of beginning with things that for a lot of people don't make any sense and finally winding up getting to the animals that they know something about to start with, as opposed to flipping it around and starting with either ecology or major groups of animals yeah. and then eventually saying, let's see how these work. Yes. Do you think that really has an effect on how people view different groups of animals? I'm not trying to put the big picture now. No, you're, I, I, you're absolutely right. In fact, um, when I moved from Berkeley to Cornell, I switched from teaching small classes in natural history and herpetology, which I did my first 20 years as a professor, to teaching a large introductory biology class to non-majors. And I mean, it was a very humbling experience and a very thought-provoking experience in lots of ways. But one of the things that happened was, I was appalled to find out that many introductory biology classes have essentially squeezed out whole organisms. And they are front-loaded with molecules, and in fact what happens is they mostly get taught by molecular biologists and physiologists who, because they don't know anything about ecology and behavior, essentially don't talk about that part of biology. So when I got to Cornell, I found out that the course I was supposed to teach in 28 weeks over two semesters had 23 weeks of molecular biology. The remaining five weeks were mostly about population genetics and evolution. There was no ecology, no behavior. And if you can imagine, and of course for non-majors, no conservation. And uh, the fortunate thing was that I was old enough and had enough clout that uh, I simply refused to teach it. And there was a standoff for a year between me and various people and my refusal to teach this course. And because my department had backed me up, eventually they gave me one of the two semesters. Uh, in fact, there's evidence, there's research that supports exactly what you're saying, that we learn better when we start with a broad context and go down to finer grain things than the way it's been done. And so we switched the non-majors course, and now the first semester of central biology for business majors and so forth at Cornell is my semester, and we start out with biological diversity, and we talk evolution, and ecology, and behavior, and conservation, and that's half of biology. And the second semester, the part that teaches them more about their bodies, about biochemistry and physiology. So, so I hope that's not too long-winded an answer, but I think it's a terrible thing that biology has drifted over the past 30 years, to, to, especially biology education. It's not terrible that molecular biology 
is important because molecular biology has done so much for us in terms of human welfare and understanding life and so forth. But I think it is a terrible thing that has eclipsed the teaching, the teaching of organismal biology. And so uh, there's really a movement underway now to change that. I really think there is. I, it, it's going to get better. And it's very satisfying to teach business majors what I've been talking to you about tonight and, and find out that in the freshman dorm, they have trees of life on butcher paper taped to the walls so that as they go back and forth, they, they can study these uh, trees of life and so forth. It's very gratifying to see that the people are, are quite willing to learn that. 